So let's get the show on the road. If we can have the slides up. It's hilarious with these quotes that they've put here that um, I can't remember giving the quote. It sounds wonderful, um, but I can't remember when I gave it. But it's true. We have such an opportunity to make a difference in our own schools without worrying too much. I love that notion of pr uh, stop proving and start improving. Take a look at this, though. Just see how well you can do with this test. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Correct answer? The answer is 13. Do you get it? Yeah. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! Okay, there is enough nervous laughter in the room for me to know that some of you at least hadn't spotted that bear the first time round. And I bet there's probably 80% of you who've seen this video clip before. I'd reckon half of those people still didn't see the bear and feel even more stupid than the people who didn't spot it, having never seen the video. And then there'll be the smug ones who uh, knew what was coming and whispered to their friend, I know what's going to come, and didn't tell them. Um, yeah, an advert for looking out for cyclists, to design to get people thinking. The reason I like it is it makes me think about what it's like when you're a classroom teacher. There's so much going on in a classroom that we pick up um, with a sixth sense. It, we change our actions based on that. So we pick up on the lack of attention of a youngster. We change the pace. Um, we notice that it's snowing outside. We realize the plan that we had set out at 11 o'clock on Sunday night is no longer going to be viable um, because it's snowing and raining and howling a gale outside. We make big decisions based on the sixth sense. And when you're doing your first couple of years of teaching, as that wonderful um, graph showed, we are very aware of making those decisions. And as we practice them more, we become less aware of it. Teaching, in its essence, becomes easier. But it also means that we're close, perhaps, to potential innovation and changes that we could make. If you've ever seen a change that you could have made and said to yourself, but why would I make that change? You know, why? Life's okay, we're um, good or outstanding or we're um, doing well enough already. That incidentally, we're doing enough already or we're doing well enough already was written on a post-it note after um, a talk not dissimilar to the one I'm giving to you now as feedback for me. That was nice, wasn't it? Um, I want to share stories that inspire you and perhaps give you ideas that you can share with staff. Um, they will, I think, and from what we've done, we feel we, we know that they make improvements in the schools we've been working with. And I wonder whether they could create the same changes and improvements in um, all of our schools. Key reason behind it, though, is um, that if I asked you what makes a great teacher, and from the talent in the room, I wonder how many different responses we, we would get. How many, I mean, what makes teaching great? Have you ever asked your teachers that question? And then how many replies did you get back? It, the number of replies in this room would be in the scores, maybe in the hundreds, in terms of adjectives that we use, verbs that we employ to describe great teaching and learning. And um, one author that got me thinking about this is Roger Martin. He's a business professor in Toronto. And he has this notion that a lot of things in the world, not necessarily just teaching and learning, operate in that mystery area that um, actually we don't really know how they work, but we're happy to. Think of your trip home tonight. You don't necessarily know um, how the vehicle you're in, whether it's a plane, train, or automobile, is getting you there. It's mystery, and we're quite happy with that. But many things we want to get into heuristics. A lot of teaching feels like it's in heuristics. Heuristics are your, your gut feel about what makes a good learning experience, the knack that you have to get a class engaged. And what he suggests is this move towards algorithm. And of course, you'll lose some of the richness that we've had with the heuristics when you move into algorithmic ideas about what makes something great. But the thing about algorithms is they're very copyable. They make life easier. So I'm not proposing necessarily that what I'm going to share with you today helps you move into algorithmic 
teaching and learning, which has a horrible ring to it, doesn't it? But I am interested in terms of identifying which heuristics are repeatedly the interesting ones, creating the, the positive energy in our classrooms. And I'm going to draw on one of my favorite um, reviewers of research, if you like, and he's sat in the back of the room. It's Guy Claxton. It's quite nice to be in giving a keynote in the same stage as someone who you use day to day in developing the learning uh, uh, opportunities for the young people you work with. The thing that I like the most because it was succinct was the underpinning kind of pillars of what makes great learning. And when I share these with you, and I thank Guy for letting me, um, if you like, pimp his ride, because it's his stuff. But when I share these with you, I think you'll nod your head quite vigorously when you see them. The first thing that kids want in learning is challenge. And I think we know they want challenge when we think about what happens at Christmas time. What do you think most teenage boys and girls are going to want to be doing on Christmas Day? They're going to want to be playing their video games. Now, you don't see a kid spending 40 quid on a video game that's easy, that they're going to finish on Christmas Day. The average amount of time it takes to play a video game is about 45 hours of gameplay. And the other thing about video games now is that they generally don't get sold um, as standalone sit on your PC games. They're networked. Because if it's challenging, if you're working in your zone of proximal development continuously, you want to collaborate on it. And one of the challenges for high school teachers, I'm a high school French and German teacher by trade, I saw 180 kids a week. Do you think it was possible for me to know algorithmically, minute by minute, day by day, whether every one of those children was operating in their zone of proximal development? and whether they were collaborating with the right person that they should be collaborating with to, get that, um, to move their learning further on, it's just not possible to keep track of that. Even as a primary school educator with 20, 30 kids in your classroom, it's incredibly difficult. So if we've got challenge and collaboration, the other thing they want is responsibility for their learning. This is one that um, you see more often perhaps in primary school, and ironically, the more that we want children to succeed and be outstanding, by external measures, the more we manage to kill responsibility sometimes. Responsibility for your learning isn't just about owning your learning, it's also about owning that story of your learning. When your mum and dad ask you, how was school today? What's the stock response you get back? You tell me. How was school today? Bye. Oh, it was all right. It was all right, fine. My daughter is five. She's been in formal education for all of 10 weeks. What do you think she says when I ask her, how was school today? It's all right. What did you learn? Can't remember. And it's an avoidance tactic, really, because it's hard to remember what you learned and think about it. If it's responsibility for learning, it's also another R word, the respect that we give to young people. There's no point in uh, the example I'll use is a personal one, aged 15, wanting to use the word although in French, which is bien que. So I use bien que incorrectly because you need to use the subjunctive after it. And I was told this, I said, oh, it's a very difficult word to use, don't use although. What do you mean don't use although? Try but instead. But it's, it's not but I want to say, it's although I want to say. I had the responsibility that had been given to me ripped away from me. The respect for learning wasn't there because she had a plan she wanted to follow religiously. And so the respect for that learning wasn't there. The respect for the journey that a youngster wants to take, even when it seems on an improbable tangent, is vital. They want to get their teeth stuck into real things. Uh, most people don't like fake pseudo problems when it comes to learning. I apologize now to mathematicians, but I'm a languages teacher, so it's easier to pick a new than it is in languages. I'll do it later. But in mathematics online, you will find some amazing examples of where we don't do real things. We miss the opportunity. Here's one such example. So what is the vertical change from A to B, B to C, C to D? Correct answer is, I don't care. It, it, if you see a ski lift like that, what is the correct answer? It's run a bloody mile, fast. It's going to fall over. What about this one? Expand. Stupid question nonsensical gets stupid answer. I quite like it. I do like the fact that the teacher's got a sense of humor. Very funny, Peter. And, and then this one. So um, this is my favorite. Does the object continue to move after it comes to rest? No, there is an elephant in the way. 
But isn't it a shame that the teacher feels obliged to mark it zero? Zero. That's not correct. Um, and they've circled the elephant as if to query whether it should be a giraffe or something else. <laughs> Incidentally, if you're on Twitter, um, as I go through, hopefully this is working, but my keynote file is actually tweeting on my behalf. So you can go and find loads of other examples of such things like this, and you can read more about um, Guy's research and buy his book. Um, those tweets are going out. So if, if I do something quite fast and you want to delve deeper, just go onto Twitter and press the link and you can read something more in depth about anything I'm mentioning. So we've got these um, three R's and we've got two C's. The last C is an incredibly important one, choice. And what is good choice? There's wonderful research from Sheena Iyengar in the States where she, you know, using olive oil and jam. You've all bought olive oil in the supermarket recently, I'm sure. You know, you walk in, how many varieties of olive oil do you get these days? It's 48 varieties in my local Asda. This is Asda. Asda. And I want to fry a sausage. I have 48 choices of various oils. And of course, you, you know, the, if, you're, if it's late at night and you want to fry a sausage, you go to the spar. And in spar, what choice do you get? Three. You get the super cheap, might not even be olive oil, olive oil. You get the own brand in the middle, and then you get the super luxurious, um, pressed by the children of Cistercian monks in southwest France or something like that. And it's out of, out of price. And you make a decision because you can. You've got enough choices, but not too many. Well, too many choices, we have that paradox of choice. So in, with young people, we might look at Sheena's research and think about 10, 11, 12 choices is an optimal number of choices, perhaps, for young people to explore in their learning. Key to it for me is the difference between a great question and a poor question. If you want to have those three C's and three R's, generally it starts with the question that we ask our young people. Most of the schools we work with love starting their projects with this exercise, which is simply finding a rough area of exploration, creatures under the sea, or um, a pop, you know, the, how will London cope with the Olympics? And then they have the Googleable questions and the not Googleable questions. And they ask the children, go and put all your questions up that you've got about this area in the right category. And the one that fills up first is, of course, Googleable. Lots of lower order Googleable questions. So they say, okay, go off. Go and Google those questions. Go and find the answers. But let's use our valuable class time to explore these much more interesting, higher order, non googleable questions. And out of that, maybe a project will develop. And then the process that they use. Uh, mention was made in the introduction that I like taking processes from the creative industries. So one process that our um, teachers in Australia in particular have loved has been design thinking straight from uh, IDEO, a big design firm, and Stanford University's D School, uh, which is where this graphic's from. Design thinking kicks off. Once you've found those uh, Googleable, not Googleable questions, it kicks off with empathy and observation research, basically. Go and explore those questions. Go and see what answers you can dig up. Think about how someone else on the other side of the world might look at that issue, that challenge, that problem that you're looking at. And then once you've amassed all that data, all that information, what would you as a student define as the problem worth solving? So it's not the teacher giving the problem to the students. It's actually the students themselves defining their own problem. Then come up with some ideas, build a prototype really quickly to show off your, your learning and get feedback all the time. Feedback, feedback, feedback. So you can come up with fresh ideas, better ones, re-prototype them and build them up. And it's a beautiful model of both divergent and convergent thinking. But in traditional schools, when the teacher's st staying up to make their lesson plans, probably for a head teacher who might want to see it one day, they're sat up at Sunday night at 11 o'clock with a glass of red wine, looking at the vast expanse of the topic that they're going to look at. Say it's environment. Say, oh, environment, I've got environment to do tomorrow. What, what could I look at in environment? I know, we'll do Antarctica. And you hear that language in, in, in you know, staff rooms. I'm doing Antarctica. How do you do Antarctica? I've never, I, I can't work out if it's penguins or icebergs. So the children come in, and they come up with some ideas to solve the problems that the teacher has dished up for them. And they might prototype a video, a podcast, or they might prototype an essay. And very often, even the feedback is owned by the teacher. It's the teacher giving that feedback rather than the student. 
And uh, I'm not saying it's the case all the time, but in most of the classrooms that we've observed over the last two to three years, that's what we've seen. And so we've been exploring what happens when we get rid of all those lines and we hand that whole process back to the learners. And I want to just share um, uh, one story with you. It's about moving from saying, yeah, we're going to work problem-solving skills. We want a generation of problem solvers to saying, no, we also want problem finders. Young people who can find interesting problems and have the capacity to go off and research and solve them. And so many of the world's real challenges need better finding of problems above all. One of the things I do when I'm working with kids in particular is show them a video. And this was a video I showed them in a school in Sunderland. This is Bobby McFerrin teaching us about neuroscience. So Bobby McFerrin does this talk about how your brain is hardwired for the pentatonic scale and demos it with his audience. And I showed this to a bunch of seven and eight year olds in Thorny Close in Sunderland. And they loved it. So they said, um, what we would like to do is replicate that experiment. So they went through to the year ones, replicated it. It was beautiful. It worked. And then very quickly they said, look, we would like to do something like that too. We would like to give our own talks. And I said, what do you mean give your own talks? We want to do those kinds of talks. Um, now, we had been asked to work with the school because the children were having trouble in speaking and writing. So for us, this was a gift, absolute gift, to have young people saying we'd like to write interesting talks like that. So I said, okay, well, what would you talk about? And if you ask your average um, seven-year-old what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, it's too much choice for them. They end up talking about their dog or pet, hamster, about football teams, if you come from Sunderland, certainly, and about your mum. And that's exactly what one of the little girls said. I want to talk about my mum. And my reaction was one that we use in design thinking. Uh, it's called, so what, who cares? So if you hear an idea, you test it out, you kind of say, so what, who cares? So this girl, she said, I want to talk about my mum. And I said, so what, who cares? And she burst into tears. I realised why I was a secondary school teacher and not a primary school teacher. And um, once we explored why, it was because we've all had a mum at some point, or we have a mum. So that in itself isn't particularly unique, interesting. What could you do to make that different? And we realized that it came down not just to finding an interesting problem, but also in the way that you craft the story around it. So we started looking at storytelling. This is me with the new iPad 5. It's incredible. Uh, real tangible page turns and everything. But the reason we're reading Little Red Riding Hood is because it's a brilliant story. It's got pretty much every plot device and mechanic in it that you can use. Lots of adjectival use, the long line of the story. And so we logged those. We wrote down all those things that the children were spotting in the structure of a story that otherwise was for babies. And they loved it. They suddenly realized that there were ingredients that they could use in their storytelling. So the next thing was wanting to do what David Perkins, the Harvard researcher, calls playing the whole game. I wanted these children in six weeks' time, they wanted in six weeks' time, to stand on a stage like this and give a talk to maybe 200, 300 strangers. It's quite nerve-wracking, and it's a big task. So how do you get children writing that kind of story? Well, you play a small version of the game. And so I thought, well, why don't we just use a real game? So we took a video game. And I said to them, this is called Machinarium, and the reason I like it, it's just beautiful, rich graphics. Beautiful graphics. Totally different from the world they inhabit. And the whole game was this. In 20 minutes flat, I want you to write the best story you've ever written, but it can only be two lines long. That's it. Go. And the clock was on. And the youngsters came up to the game, came up to the screen, and explored it started looking at the kinds of things that were in it. How could they describe that language? How could they employ some of the Little Red Riding Hood tricks that they had learned? Would you like to hear some of their writing? Beautiful stuff. Remember, these are seven-year-olds with trouble in speaking and writing. In an ancient, horrifying castle on a mysterious hill, in a bubbly, pitch-black sky, I chopped down like a prickly skeleton bone. I can hear a dino roar. 
The gruesome grisly castle laid on a horrifying planet, the trees like ghouls' hands emerging out of the volcanic ground. There was a spooky flying robot. The deadly castle is even a graveyard, trees charging out in rage. It's not bad, is it? Is it? You tell me, have you been offsteaded that much that you're not sure whether that's <laughs> is that good? Is it outstanding? Is it mediocre? I'm going to tell you in good old broad Scots, it's bloody brilliant. Really rich writing that they hadn't produced before. Cultural context fits for them. Video games immediately got boys interested in this kind of task. Playing a whole game, the best story you've ever written. You've only got 20 minutes and you've only got two lines. And the fact that we had equipped them with lots of ingredients that they could refer to. The walls of the classroom were speaking to them. The walls of the classroom had everything that they needed around, so it was a real learning environment. There was a point to being in school because it was the cave of understanding of collaboration, and what we were asking them was ambitious. They were setting up a TEDx event of their own. That's what they settled on. They, had, they wanted to get the Stadium of Light and couldn't because take that, we're playing a concert that night that they wanted it. They ended up getting the university. They invited 300, mostly strangers, to come and listen to their talks. And we ended up with 60 young people, every one of them, creating a talk. And we use real tools. This is Nancy Duarte's wonderful book, Resonate. It's designed for tech startups wanting to pitch for investment and for politicians wanting to win over audiences. We gave it to them, we said, read it. See if there's something in there that you could use. And what you're seeing is their love of post-it notes to storyboard. These post-it notes to storyboard their talks, something that they didn't get taught in school, um, but which came, again, from a creative industry. That's how you create a great pitch. Um, they also did lots of this. This is another example. This is not them, but it's Think Aloud Paired Problem Solving, which you may be familiar with. It's where child on the right is, um, has created her graph in this case. Child on the left is interviewing her with Socratic questioning. Is all good five-year-olds are capable of doing. Why? Why? And so as she asks why, the child explains that she's taken all those green things, um, not because they're bits of tree, but because they're green. And the shells, it's not categorized because they're shells, it's because they're white. So her graph is actually about organizing color, sequencing color. These girls are actually about four. They're in a, a primary one class in Gullen in the east of Scotland. The important thing about this think aloud paired problem solving is that the whole exercise is being modeled in front of the class. We've had the, the big lads there, they're taller than me, teaching their peers mathematics in sixth form. And these are four-year-olds teaching their peers how to do think aloud paired problem solving before they all go off and do it. And that kind of technique was really useful with these young people, making them the models of good practice. Most of the time we were ripping the teacher away, getting them out of the way of learning. Because these young people, given the tool, were able to go and implement it themselves. They also learnt about star moments, something they'll always remember. A star moment. Every talk needs a star moment. Every lesson, can you imagine every lesson needing a star moment? If instead of tawdry lesson plans that actually stop us giving responsibility sometimes to the learner, we just asked of our teachers, what's the star moment in today's lesson? And if they struggle to answer, then you send them back to the planning. Questioning was really important. We used loads of Dylan Williams' work. Lots of basketball questioning, pose, pause, pounce, bounce. I liked Eric's addition of pose, pause, pole, pounce, bounce. But we used lots of that. We used question cubes. You can actually buy much more beautiful versions of these. Um, I'm a Scot who doesn't like spending money unless he has to. So we got the kids making their own question cubes in multicolored paper and throwing higher order question starters to probe and, and create deeper thinking in their groups without the teacher having to be the fulcrum of questioning in the classroom. The children themselves were the fulcrum of all the questioning going on because they had a tool to use to get those higher order questions done. We did no recall questions. There was no recall, there was no remembering or understanding. Most of that had been taken care of in the initial immersion. As these children started to come up with ideas about what their talk would be like, they were thinking much more about creating, analyzing, and evaluating. We tapped their emotions. 
we had Google Form set up on lots of different devices around the school, around the classroom. At any point, they could go and put in an adjective to describe how they were feeling. And then we kind of graded those adjectives based on hairy scary to nice warm and cuddly, if you like. And we showed this graph back to them so that when they're in a trough of learning, when they're in a really difficult part of a project, they realize they're not alone. Lots of young people feel the same way. And what happens if you're in a difficult phase and you come to an event like this and you realize actually it's the time of year, everyone's feeling a bit tired. What does that do for you? It lifts you and sometimes gives you the motivation to do something extraordinary on the back of it. And we showed them the adjectives they were using. Can you imagine for six weeks of a project having young people saying that they're scared? Imagine that. How, how, are you, how was school today? I was terrified. Well, tell me more. I'm interested. And then this is how they felt uh, two minutes after their talk. Relieved, happy, proud. That pride in learning is so important. They were amazed that they'd done it, glad it was over, some of them. But I loved the little, a couple of them said that they wanted to do it again. They wished they'd spoken a bit louder. So you still had the formative assessment ticking over. They saw that as just another prototype that they were doing. The day itself came along, they'd forgotten to paint these, so I got covered in red paint taking these onto the bus. And they set their talk up in the university. 300 people turned up. And that's the girl who did the talk about her mum. Her talk ended up becoming, why is it that we never tell the people closest to us that we love them? There wasn't a dry eye in the house, not a, a person wondering what they would do that evening when they got home. We sent their talks out on Twitter, much in the same way as I'm about to do. Would you like to hear some of the talk titles that they eventually came up with and investigated and developed? As we tweeted these out, they had reactions from all over the world through us, the teachers, using our network to give them an even larger audience. And every child was involved in, and incredibly proud of their involvement, if you like. Some of the talks were fantastic. Do animals have a secret language? What is baby's secret language? Which cancer should we invest in curing first? Why do slugs need slime? That video's got over 3,000 views now on YouTube. I've just tweeted it out. You know, do you know the answers to any of these questions? Do you? They're non-Googleable. Tell you that now. These children have made them Googleable by doing their research and having their talk online. You can actually Google these now, and you'll get their answer. Um, this girl had a wonderful talk all about being sick and why it's important to be sick. Um, and her title was, Can You Make Artificial Vomit? And her star moment was making artificial vomit and throwing it at great velocity into the crowd. It was brilliant. And every child was involved. There wasn't one child who didn't give a talk, who didn't sign a talk. We had a dumb child able to give a talk in his way. All of these can be viewed online, on YouTube. They can use their own problems as great examples for other people. The reaction from their peers was astounding. The reaction to each other was the kind of reaction that you would love to have at the end of every lesson. Not a teacher or a big grade A stamped onto a piece of work, but a peer leaping in joy at hearing his friend giving an amazing talk and having an audience to share in that success. We all love it. We all want it. But the learning opportunity is what makes that happen. If a teacher had been spoon-feeding them the stuff, you would never have had that. Do you think they would care about the grade level they got for speaking and writing in this? Not at all, not an iota. It doesn't matter anymore. All they care about are the comments that will make them better. It is the ultimate in three C's and three R's. It's a Claxton-esque project, I hope, I think, because what it is doing is giving children real stuff with real risk of failure, letting them fail in class, giving them plenty of resources, letting the walls of the classroom speak. Above all, shifting that focus from assessment that helps the teacher, much like that awareness test that I kicked off with, assessment that the teacher uses to change what the teacher is going to do, to real assessment for learning, where young people are aware of the environment around them, what's going on, what they've learnt, what their journey's been, where they are now, and what they're going to do next. 
I want to um, end by sharing a little bit of a technological story as well, because technology is changing the landscape of that kind of project very fast. And the story is at Rosendale, uh, Neil Hopkins, I think, has been here. Rosendale Primary School in London. It's a very different school from many. They ha didn't have enough space for a school library, so they got hold of a bus, and that's now become their school library. Destination, where reading is fun. With the help of parents, they pulled this together. It's my favorite sign, no shushing. And their journey was all about how might we better tell the story for every single child in the school. Not how can the teacher do better reporting for parents, how can the child own the story of learning in their school? Now, they undertook a very similar kind of project to the one that I've just described, a really immersive learning project. But something began to emerge because um, immersion involves really messy walls in your classroom. It involves putting all the learning up on the wall. All these green post-it notes are comments and additions from peers to each other. It's like little messages saying, oh, you might want to try this, you might want to try that. It gets really messy, and in a non-digital world, it's almost too messy to make sense of. So the teachers started to use these kind of luggage labels, and as the children defined the problem they wanted to solve, bringing their information together in clusters, their research in clusters, the teachers began to think, I wonder if we could use these luggage labels to better help the children identify what it is they're learning, both in curricular terms, um, in, in, in subject matter, but also in terms of emotion. And then they said, well, why don't we get the children writing their own luggage labels and these plastic covered labels? Why don't we get them doing it in their jotters at the top? What are the three tags you would use to describe this piece of work that you've been doing? What, what is at its core? Why are you doing it? Number one question children must be able to really understand fundamentally is, why am I doing this learning? Why am I undertaking this task? What's its purpose? We placed them next to the computers. And then we used an application it's on the web, it's on mobile, it's on iPads, it's on everything. We had only got a couple of computers in the school. We put the tags in there and gave them Evernote. And Evernote is just a consumer-free thing that allows you to remember anything. Take a photo, make a video, record some audio. And so children took photos, videos, audio, wrote little reflections about their learning. We discovered when they invented their own tags that they were learning stuff that wasn't on the lesson plan. Unexpected, beautiful, happy accidents of learning. And their reflections showed that journey of where have I been, where am I now, where am I going? At first I only knew one answer to the eight times tables. Where have I been? Where am I now? Well, when I practiced using number cards, I got better and better. Where am I going next? Next time I'll do that with division. It's all there. And her tags are improve, Maths, multiplication, and proud. And it means that the entire school can see a stream of learning. These are children browsing other children's learning. They're seeing what makes that smart kid smart. How can I be like that? What kinds of things are they looking at? Photographing, recording. And really the learning's very traditional, if you like. It's based around, well, what's the subject area you're looking at? What's the detail of that subject you're looking at? And how do you feel about that learning? You can see the parallels with the Sunderland project that I just mentioned to you. So I'm going to end now just with a quick recap, if you like, of where we are. I love, guys, three C's and three R's as a simple rubric to bear in mind when you're planning a lesson, planning a unit, planning a year, or planning a whole school. Because if you achieve it, as we've achieved it in projects, the sum of those parts is so much greater for those young people. I want to see more students having that reaction to class, not wanting to leave, wanting to congratulate each other on mutual successes. I want to see children building and making stuff to learn, something you're about to hear more for, um, about from a master maker. Using design processes that don't come from education and not being afraid of it because it doesn't come from education, it's not got an education tag on it, but saying, I'm going to try it because it's different and different might lead to something better. But I'm also going to marry it with what education research we've got to see whether it works. Using technology where it genuinely does something different for you and looking at how much of that journey we can share with each other so that instead of being locked up in a classroom with the door shut, 
based on the heuristics, the gut feel of wonderful teachers, we're able to share it wider so that more teachers can become wonderful as well. Doing it's not easy, I'm not going to pretend it is. Um, I'm going to end with a quote, though, that I think sums up the challenge ahead. It's from my favourite composer. To achieve great things, two things are needed. A plan and not quite enough time. Now, I am absolutely out of the latter. But I also think in English education, you're beginning to run out of the latter. And there's a certain case for saying, get your hands dirty. Go and try something now. And I would say, if you're on Twitter, the one thing you can do to spur action is just tweet out now or say to your neighbour, um, what is it you're going to do next after two days here? What's your next big or little step going to be to get your action kicking off? Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful two days spent with you. <laughs>